Welcome to this week's episode of Rocky Mountain Marketing. I'm Katie Brinkley, and you're listening to the premier podcast for business owners ready to elevate their influence and impact in the industry. Have you ever wondered how digital marketing can revolutionize your business? With two decades of experience empowering business leaders, consultants, and coaches, I understand the transformative power of digital marketing. Today, we're not just discussing strategies, we're crafting your digital legacy. In each episode, we'll dissect the trends, strategies, and insights that are shaping the future of marketing. You'll walk away with actionable knowledge to thrust your business forward and stories of local enterprises making a global impact. Are you ready to turn insights into action? Let's jump into today's episode of Rocky Mountain Marketing and start shaping your legacy. Hold on to your seats, folks, because we are going to have a riveting conversation today. Yes, we are diving into Texas. Wait, please, seriously, stay here. You are going to love today's episode because I brought in the funnest, most exciting person that I could think of to have this conversation with. She and I have known each other. Man, we've met actually, I think it was during COVID or maybe it was pre-COVID and I was a guest on her show. We see each other at live events all the time. She was the closing keynote at PodFest in 2023. I'm talking about Heather Zeitzwolf. And she's not, honestly, she's not your stereotypical introverted button-down accountant. You're never going to see her wearing a suit. In fact, for those of you that are watching on YouTube, You get to see how fun and exciting Heather is. She is typically not hard to miss with pink hair. Today, she's got amazing multicolored dreadlocks. Heather, thank you so much for joining me to talk some taxes and bookkeeping on Rocky Mountain Marketing. Thank you for having me. This is it's a topic that people are afraid of. They think, Ugh, but now it's that time of year where everyone has to think about it. So I'm very excited to be here to discuss it. And you, like I said, I was a guest on your show, which is Get Radical With Your Business. And you're, you really know how to make, I'm sure it's fun for you, but I really think that bookkeeping and then spreadsheets and stuff is super boring. My husband is a financial analyst. He does a lot with Excel. And I, man, whenever I want to just figure out how, I'm like, I, why can't I get this code to work? He'll give me some, oh, all you do is sum equals parentheses. And I... Yeah, but you know how to make it fun. And I love following on social media. You always have so many great tips for us as business owners. Let's just talk a little bit about what you're so different with the way that you approach bookkeeping and taxes. And how did you really find your way into this niche? Because I really feel like it's, you don't fit the mold. Uh, yes, I know. My my parents were like, what? You're going to study what? No. A- actually, it makes sense to me because I am a creative person. My, my first career was in fashion. So I get creatives and I mainly work with creatives. And But I have this analytical nerdy side. So I was always the kid who loved math. And I always loved spreadsheets. When I first found out about spreadsheets, I went nuts. I was like, oh my God, this is the coolest thing ever. So it makes sense to me. I love that kind of stuff. I love calculators. I played with that stuff as kids. I used to always count my money. I I loved it. So it makes sense in my brain, my wacky brain. And, but, and, but I like to make it fun. So because I work with creatives, a lot of them are like you, where they're like spreadsheets, bookkeeping. Oh, I hate that stuff. Taxes. And it can be dry, but I've always been besides spreadsheets. I've always loved to fill out forms. So a tax forms, I actually find joy in it. I'm weird. <laughs> thank, thank goodness. There's people like you out there. And I wanted to bring you on the show now, because at the time of this recording, it is tax season. And with tax season, I know it's a lot of, oh man, it's that time of year again. So I want to make sure that we are talking about all of the important things that you need to do for this time of year so that you are set up for success when it comes to filing taxes the right way. But then, and like I said, folks, stick with me here because I wanted to bring in the funnest person possible to have this conversation with. And we're going to learn a lot of great 
key things that you should be doing for your business, just from important deadlines that you need to make sure that you're being aware of, the different types of forms, entity information, labor information. And I guess actually let's start with labor information, Heather. So with labor, for me, I have a couple full-time employees. I have some contractors. And there's certain times where even though I have a business, I'll still get 1099 forms from different companies. And let's just walk through these different forms that we need to be aware of for tax season. Yeah. Okay. Because we're dealing with the IRS and then also with possibly your state, if you're filing for those for payroll, 1099s, that sort of thing, every state is different. And I just want to give a caveat that this is not tax advice. Yeah. This is just information. So a lot of these, make sure that you do your own due diligence. So we're just going to talk about some basic things. But yes, first off, if you do have 1099s that you were supposed to file or payroll, that was due a January 31st. So hopefully you got that all in. But if you haven't, hurry up and do it. You're past the deadline, but you don't want to end up with penalties and all of that. Payroll is something you never want to mess with. With So hopefully if you do have employees that you are working with a payroll company and they can help you file those things and make sure that they get in on time. And then if you need to do amended ones, they can do that. But a lot of times people do their own 1099s and there are companies out there that online that you can file your 1099s with. But again, they were due uh, January 31st and your state might be different as far as the deadline goes. Um, as far as who gets what and all of that, I know it can be extremely confusing and they keep telling us every year that they're gonna change a few things, but there are there's different criteria for who gets a 1099, why they get a 1099, when they get a 1099. And so I think in your case, you're probably talking about what's called a 1099 NEC, which is for, for someone that's not your employee, basically. So a contractor. And if you paid them with cash or check or something that's equivalent to that, then if you paid them $600 or more, you need to issue them a 1099. But because now we use things like PayPal and Venmo and the, all these electronic types of maybe your debit card, that sort of thing, it depends on how you've paid them if you actually need to issue them a 1099 or not. So if you've paid them with a, like a credit card, then you don't need to worry about it. Same thing if it was with one of these electronic type payment systems. Look at the rules and just see if you do need to file or not before you go ahead and do that. And then also if you are paying someone that is a corporation, you don't need to give them a 1099 anyways. It works that way. But Backing up though, before all of these 1099 things, when you do bring on a contractor, the first thing that you should do is have them fill out what's called a W-9, which is just something that you keep on file and it will give you their information. So if they have a social security number, EIN, whatever they uh, use for their business, and they actually have to fill out, I'm an LLC, or it'll say that they're a corporation. And then you just keep that on file. And then when you go to file the 1099s, then you have all the information you need. You're not supposed to be scrambling come January to get this. Always do it in advance. That's that's a really good point. I think that with a lot of contractors, we, because a, a lot of people will contract out me and my business because we're your, your, we're your outsourced marketing department. A lot of times it there's, I can tell you probably going back and thinking about like how many clients we brought on just in 2023 and how many of those forms I filled out. And I'm like, I only filled out one. And so I think it, it really comes down to knowing your business inside and out, what type of deadlines that you should be aware of. You said January 31st, that the deadline's already coming on. You needed to have this done. Is there a good way that you would kind of get someone up and running to make sure that, hey, these are the things, these are the forms that before you bring on any contractor or outsource anything, these are some of the check marks or like a checklist that you should make sure that you do with every new person you bring on. Yeah, I think it's great to have a checklist when you onboard somebody. So just we, just think about a, a contractor like an employee, like an employee, you'd have an onboarding, you'd give them maybe your manual or whatever that you would do with them. A contractor, think of them in this similar way. Now, 
a contractor could also be the guy that's fixing your electricity in your shop. They come in different flavors. In our worlds, we're talking about social media. We may have a VA or something like that. That's what we think of when we think of contractors. So it really depends on your industry, how you're going to think about who you're bringing into your business. And again, it's just collecting the information in a timely basis and making sure that you've got all of your ducks in a row, you're following all the rules. Hopefully you're working with an accountant, a CPA, a bookkeeper, somebody that can be that sort of that angel on your shoulder being like, hey, don't forget about this or that. You're in business. You need to remember these things. And it's not just like 1099s and all that. Your state, your local, you may have local taxes that you have to abide by. There might be some sort of sales tax or some other kind of tax that may be in your state that you have to deal with that uh, is not just like once a year you file this. It could be on a quarterly basis, on a monthly basis. So you want to make sure that you do understand what are the local ramifications of having a business where you're located. And then also, of course, for the IRS. As far as like the dates, you can Google that. It's, It's every year. They stay pretty similar, but there might be a holiday in there that might push a day. Depends on where the holidays are. Sometimes tax day is April 15th. Sometimes it's April 16th or 17th. Just depends. And then also if you are filing a business return, so it's a separate return from maybe your individual return. So it depends on your entity structure. Those business returns are actually due a month before your personal return. So making sure that you know about that deadline. So it depends on how your entity is structured. Of course, you can always do an extension, but with an extension, you always want to remember that and it's an extension to file your taxes, not to pay your taxes. So this is where I think a lot of people get tripped up. They're like, oh, I filed an extension. I don't need to pay taxes for a while. That's not how it works. So they want your money now. (laughs) <laughs> and hopefully you've been paying estimated taxes throughout the year. And again, that's something that people have a tendency to forget about. Like we're in mm-hmm. business, we're making money. People forget, oh yeah, there's a chunk of this that has to go to the government. And it's always best if you can pay on a quarterly basis. Heather, I, and like you said earlier, this is not financial advice. These are just fin- you know, best practices and things to be aware of because every business is different and every state right. is different. And every, like mm-hmm. for my business, I have some contractors that are here in the United States. I have an employee that's here in the United States. And then I have some employees and contractors that are overseas. How for businesses that are like mine, what are some of your, cause I know a lot of marketing agencies in particular, and I'm honestly, a lot of businesses, one of my clients, he has an executive assistant, but she's located over in the Philippines. How do you manage paying and calculating for those type of contractors that might not necessarily be stateside? Mm. Yeah, so there's a lot of considerations with that, and you might have to pay foreign transaction fees and all of that. So build that in and make sure. But And then again, you're dealing with something that's in a foreign country. You want to just make sure that you're using best practices. There are a lot of scammers out there. I'm not saying that. Just make sure that you're working with a reputable company. Make sure you understand their payment system, how they want to get paid. And as far as if it's local, if you have somebody in the United States that you are filing, they're actually on your payroll, you want to make sure that wherever they're located, that you understand what the tax consequences are of them living in that state. Because depending on the size of your business, you may have to give them health care or pay mm-hmm. tax. You may have to file your taxes in that state. So there's this thing called nexus, which and each state is different. So it depends on if the state deems that you have nexus in their state, which means you've been doing some kind of like transactions there. Maybe you're selling things there or you're performing services there or you have an you have employees there. So you may have to actually file a tax return for that state. So always just understand, okay, if I'm hiring somebody in California, like California is one with like tons of rules, like they have very strict rules about who's a contractor, who's an employee. If you're going to hire, I'm saying hire, quote unquote, a contractor from California, you better make sure that they are a, a contractor. They look, smell, and feel like a contractor to the state of California because you don't want to break the rules. So always just know what's going on in the state that you're hiring somebody. 
That's such a good point. And all of these states are different and have different rules. And at the time of this recording, right now, we're, if you're, like you said earlier, if you're not already in the process of getting this stuff done, you got to get on it. So if somebody is listening to this and they're like, oh, fine, Katie and Heather, you've reminded me, I know I got to do it, but uh, I guess I'll do it today. What would you recommend to people that are ready to get their business, that want to get their business ready for taxes? Do you have a sort of checklist or like tracking expenses? Let's talk about getting our business ready to file taxes this year. Yeah, hopefully people have been doing this all throughout the year. I'm not shaming anybody, but that's really how you should be structuring your business is not doing this race to the finish line, April 15th. And hey, a lot of people do it that way. I, I personally wouldn't run a business that way because you wanna be able to know what's going on in your business throughout the year. But if you are in that situation where you're, oh my God, I've got it, I've got receipts over here and I've got, oh my God, what now you're going through your bank statements and trying to figure out all the things. It does happen. Just stay as organized as you can, save receipts. If you're somebody that hates this stuff and you're just like, okay, I'll just tally it up at the end of the year, just make sure that you're keeping things in an organized place. Whether it's a shoebox, and then people always talk about the shoebox, or maybe it's like putting things into a, a Google Drive. Maybe you've got a folder for each year, but just try to be as organized as you can and be, do this on a timely manner. Now, again, if you are scrambling and you hate spreadsheets, you can always do it the old fashioned way of piling up your receipts and tallying up how much you have in each category and using that to fill out your tax return. But if you are uh, working with maybe a CPA and you're not doing it like through TurboTax or something like that, uh, it's best to have things more organized. They're going to probably expect you to have what's called a profit and loss statement. And depending on the type of entity of your business, you may need a balance sheet. They may want to look at what kind of assets that you've purchased. Okay, Heather, man, and you're, you're saying all these things that we got to do here. <laughs> Is there a software that you would I know we're supposed to keep it fun, fun, right? <laughs> uh, you're like, oh, please, Heather, no. Okay. Yes, there's all kinds of software. Depending on the size of your business, if you have inventory, you're probably going to want to have a different type of bookkeeping software that will you'll be able to either tie with your POS system or something like that. But, okay, just let's just say for the solopreneur, you can use something like Wave, which is a free accounting, a free bookkeeping service. Yeah. And it's there are elements of it that you have to pay for to use. But if you're on a budget or you just want something that's very simple, that's a great tool to use. Now, you also probably will want an accountant to do a once over on it before you hand in your taxes because there are nuances to accounting that the average Joe may not know. And so there's that, a wave. FreshBooks is another one that's a low cost one. QuickBooks, that's like the big daddy. They have different types of levels depending on the type of business. There's Zero and Zoho has their own. There's a lot of different bookkeeping softwares out there. They're all gonna probably do the same core type things, but it really depends on the type of reports that you want. So if you want to have really cool spreadsheets, I'm saying spreadsheets, maybe if you want a cool dashboard or something like that, you can always hook other types of software up to QuickBooks, Xero, that sort of thing. So it, it depends on the type of business that you have. But you, know, you were saying that you use Wave. So in Wave, just like a lot of these others, you'd hook up your bank account. And so it'd be like your credit card, your bank account, to that platform and then it brings in all the expenses and income that you have all the transactions and then you have to categorize them and make sure that you're looking at your bank statements and making sure that it all reconciles so there is an element that you know like i said i think you should have somebody professional kind of just give it a once over before you hand it in and then you were asking about checklists and things yeah. uh, we also want to think about not only the things that kind of run through our business normally, like the income and expenses. But then what about home office? Maybe you have vehicle miles. Those vehicles, hopefully you've been tracking that. A lot of us work virtually, so that's not even something that we even deal with. But if you are somebody that is on the road, salesperson, hopefully you've been 
tracking all of your miles because you're, you're supposed to keep that as you go. You're not supposed to just add it up at the end of the year. That's not how it, that's not how it works. So it's all being proactive about your taxes. And you mentioned a few times like having an accountant or a bookkeeper. I know that these are services that you offer, but for somebody that, let's say they've just been using QuickBooks or a wave, or maybe they haven't really, they've been just using Google Sheets, but their business is growing. Mm -hmm. At what point, one, would you say to bring on a bookkeeper? And two, if they haven't brought in somebody yet, and they're still confused as to the benefits of it. What's the difference between having a bookkeeper and an accountant? And at what point of the business journey should they bring somebody on? Yeah. Okay. So it does depend. So uh, I have clients that make a lot of money. They, they've got, maybe they're making like 500000 but they don't have that many expenses. Like they're consultants. They got a laptop. They've got home office, but they don't have a, like a lot of overhead. There's not a lot going on there. There's not a lot to tabulate. So maybe they don't even need a bookkeeper. They can just keep that stuff straight very easily. So I think it really depends on how many transactions you're doing. If you're using a lot of software, like if you're integrating, like maybe you're taking payments from Stripe and then you're using PayPal and you've got all these different things that you're using. We're in this uh, virtual world where a lot of people have courses and they've got all this software they're they using books. and it's all, <laughs> all this money is coming in from different places. And we want to make sure that we're gathering all that kind of stuff up in, in that, uh, that adds a level of complexity where I would think, okay, even if you're making less than a hundred thousand, maybe you need a bookkeeper or somebody there to help you keep it all straight. Cause there's mm -hmm. a lot of moving parts. So I think it really depends on the complexity maybe versus how much money that you're bringing in. Also, you asked about what the bookkeeper versus accountant has education that is like a, they've gone to school for it. They have a higher level of knowledge. It's like at a, I don't want to say higher up because a lot of bookkeepers are accountants. There's, there's some gray areas, but bookkeeping, you don't necessarily have to go to school for that. So somebody may have skills from maybe they worked in an office and they were said, Hey, we want you to fill out QuickBooks. So that could be their background. So it really depends. So you, if you are choosing a bookkeeper, if they're certified with QuickBooks or something, that's a good sign because you have to go through a lot of, of hoops to get that. But if they have some other level accounting, CPA, whatever, then you know that they have more education behind them. Nothing against bookkeepers, but they all, they come in different flavors. You just buy or beware. Yeah. <laughs> and Heather, you, you've, man, I've, we, we've talked a lot about taxes and bookkeeping and different softwares. If somebody is listening to this episode right now and they're like, man, with, at the time of this recording, we have a, a, about two-ish months before the deadline. <laughs> Is it too late to bring on a bookkeeper or an accountant if for the future they want to make sure that they're not scrambling? So many of us business owners do because, well, maybe it's just me. I do not like tax season and I'm thankful for Wave for helping me to help keep my books in, in order and everything. But, but it is something that was like, okay, now it's January. I need to start paying attention to taxes. Is there a better way for us to approach tax season for 2025 so that we're not scrambling. We have the right people in place. We have all of the forms in place. It's not going to take us a week to get everything together. Yeah. So first you asked, is it too late for last year for 2023? So yeah. no, you could, if you have your books and if you've got things in the wave, any of these, and you're like, I'm not really sure if my numbers are right or not. It's not too late. You could hire somebody to just give it a once over. We spend a lot of money in other areas, but this is like an area where uh, I'm not just saying this because of me, but I'm, it's an important area to spend a little bit of money to make sure it's done correctly. So if you are somebody that's like on a tight budget, even software like TurboTax, they have an added thing where you can have a professional look it over and all that. But granted, they're not looking at your books. They're not digging really deep into it. So I would see if you have somebody that can take a look at it and just make sure that you're not missing anything because again, the software, it's great software, but if you don't understand how accounting works, cause there's two sides, there's debits and credits. Oftentimes what I see is when I open up things like wave fresh books that people, they hook up their bank, they think everything is fine and it's actually off. Like things are not balancing. 
and there could be some other wonky things in there because you guys aren't accountants and you don't know when you just go to set up the books. If you didn't have an accountant help you set up the books, maybe have them give a once over. It's not too late. Moving forward, maybe if it, money is tight and you don't want to pay somebody or you don't have that many transactions, maybe have somebody look it over like on a quarterly basis or half the year goes by and just have them give it a once over and make sure that it looks good. But it's not something you really want to mess with. And again, you could be missing things. You could be missing income that you had no idea unless you're reconciling your bank to the books. And that's just something that people don't know about to do mm -hmm. in that software. I, I'm always going to err on being cautious and just having someone look it over. Even if you just hire them for 45 minutes, just take a look at it and make sure yeah. it looks good. When you even mentioned too, like the different expenses, like you said, oh, an office chair and oh, make sure you're doing it. And there's, I think that there's a lot of things where we want to write. I don't know, maybe it's just me, but I'm like, oh, I could write off my glasses. And then I'm like, but can I write them off? Because what if I decide to use them when I watch TV too? And then I get nervous and then I just end up like walking away and forgetting about it. And this is where it's so important to have somebody that that's trained in this and can say, yeah. The new camera that you got, Katie, for your podcast, you're using it for your guests too. That's a write-off. So it it's so helpful to have somebody that knows the ins and outs of your taxes, your business, your books that can say let that could say, yes, this is a write-off. Yeah. And we you know one area that I run into a lot because I work with a lot of purpose-driven business owners is they want to do a lot of donations. And yeah. One area that trips them up is they go to do their taxes. They think, oh, they think it's an expense, but a donation is a donation. It's not an yeah. expense. So if you are wanting to give to charities, maybe, and you want to write it off as an expense, think about ways that you can maybe be a sponsor or something where you're advertising with them at an event, and then it becomes a marketing expense. But yeah. if you are just truly donating, that's a donation. So that's not an expense. Another area I see people tripping up with is with their draws. So depending on, of course, how your entity is structured. But if you are in like a solopreneur, you're filing a Schedule C, your draws are not an expense. That's just like the money that's left over in your business. That's money that you're being... so. I'll, I'll back up for a second. So the money that you're getting taxed on when you have a Schedule C, you look at how much income you brought in, you minus out all the expenses, the money left over, that's what you get taxed on. It doesn't matter how much of that you draw out of the business or not, that's the amount you get taxed on. And again, there's certain things that like, there's the QBI deduction, there's all these different things factor into it. But just to keep it simple, that, that's where you're going to get taxed. That's a mistake I always see people making, like they think yeah, that and, draws I mean, are expense. It's the simple mistakes that the IRS is going to, that's what they're going to be like, hey, wait a second here. And then you have to go through <laughs> having to deal with the IRS. But I hope that with today's episode, so many people will, one, check out Wave. Like, I, I'm so glad you said Wave, Heather, because I feel really confident in my decision to use them now because I was, I used QuickBooks. It was a little robust for me, but there's a lot of different softwares out there that will help you. And it's not too late. Like just get your financial house in order for this, for 2023's taxes and go into, we're in 2024 now, go in with the game plan with the right software and maybe get hiring the right people to help support you. Like you said, it is somebody that's going to be helping you manage your finances. And there's a lot of things as entrepreneurs that we spend money on that probably aren't as important. If somebody is interested in working with you, Heather, one, people should absolutely check out your podcast. It's great. It's the Get the Balance Right podcast. But if people are interested in working with you or learning more about you, what's the best way for them to get in touch with you? Yeah. So the podcast used to be called Get the Balance Right. Now it's called Get Radical with oh, Your Business. That's right. So it's yeah, out there with the two, yeah, the two names. That's fine. And they can get in contact with me. Probably the easiest way is Heather at getradbiz.com or you can find me on Instagram at, at getradbiz. So that's the easiest way because my last name is hard to spell and my accounting business is called Zeitzwolf Accounting. So you can just find me on Instagram at, at 
get rad biz. <laughs> and Heather, you have great videos over on the gram. You're giving actionable tips and advice and making it fun in the process. So definitely check out Heather on the gram, listen to her podcast and give your books the love and the attention that they deserve. Thanks so much for listening to this week's episode of Rocky Mountain Marketing. I hope you're leaving with valuable insights and the inspiration to lead your market. If you've enjoyed our time together and found today's podcast episode useful, I have a small favor to ask of you. Please hit that subscribe button to stay updated with the latest episodes. And if you know someone who could benefit from these episodes, maybe a fellow business leader or an aspiring entrepreneur, go ahead and share this episode with them. Let's spread the knowledge and grow together. Also, I'd love to hear from you and continue the conversation beyond the podcast. Visit me at katiebrinkley.com to connect, to find more resources, or just to share your journey. And be sure to pick up your copy of my new book, The Social Shift at katiebrinkley.com slash book. Thanks again for tuning in. I'm Katie Brinkley, and I can't wait to dive into more strategies and stories with you on the next episode of Rocky Mountain Marketing. Let's keep on taking your marketing to new heights.